All right, everyone, welcome back to getting in a college coach conversation. Your taxes were due a week ago, uh, and I hope that you went ahead and submitted those taxes or filed for an extension. But of course, because it's tax season, we just figure maybe we should talk a little bit about tax advantages associated with saving for college. And so joining us to do that is, uh, I guess you're not giving us tax advice, right, Lori? Because you're not certified for tax advice. You're shaking your head. So no. Lori Peltier here on the show. She's a college finance expert. Welcome to the show, Lori. Hi, Ian. I'm happy to be here. All right. So no tax advice, no investment advice. We'll just stipulate that here from the beginning, but we do want to talk a little bit about some tax advantages that come with saving for college. So let's just start at the very beginning. What are these opportunities to save for college that give me tax advantages? What do those look like? So there's three that that are specific for college expenses. The 529 savings plan, the right. 529 prepaid plan, mm -hmm. and the Coverdell education savings account. Uh, these three um, come up all the time in conversations with people, you know, should I do it? Should I not do it? What's the benefit? So I thought it would be a good time to, to bring out some of those benefits. These accounts are funded with after-tax dollars, so they're mm -hmm. not going to save you any money up front. It's, you know, money that's already been through your paycheck has been taxed. Um, but once it's invested in these accounts, it grows tax free. So there is no taxation on capital gains or interest income, uh, any growth you have on the account, you will not have to pay taxes on as long as you're using the money uh, for how it was intended. So there are specifics around that. The 529 plan is kind of unique because it is affiliated with your state. Each mm -hmm. state has a 529 plan, but that does not mean you have to choose your plans from your state. It right. does not restrict where you go to school, which is a, a big uh, misconception about those. The Coverdell is a little different than the 529 plan because it's more of just a, an individual investment that you're doing on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and it has some restrictions on who can contribute as, based on their income and how much you can contribute. The Coverdell has a much smaller uh, dollar amount for a maximum contribution per year than the 529 plan. But the taxation piece of it, growing tax-free, withdrawals are tax-free if used as intended, that follows all three of them through, through their lifespan. Gotcha. And the intended use is for a qualified educational expense. Is that right? What, what does that mean? How right. can I identify a qualified educational expense. Right. And the abbreviation there is QEEs, qualified education expense, everything. So it else. is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so it first all has to be for the beneficiary named on the account. So when you okay. open these accounts, you're going to designate who the beneficiary is. Right. And we'll talk later about how you can change that. But uh, so the expense has to be for that person who's the beneficiary. And then uh, for college related, it can be tuition, fees, room and board, even off campus, if the student's at least a half-time student, uh, books, computer supplies, and K through 12 tuition expenses. If you okay. have, um, you're sending your child to a private kindergarten through 12th grade, you can pay for tuition out of that. And just recently they added loan repayment. So $10,000 a year, uh, sorry, $10,000 per account can be used to pay off student loans. If you end up borrowing for college, but then you end up having excess in your 529 plan, you could use some of it to pay off those loans. Is it possible for a parent to open a 529 for their child and then change the beneficiary to be the parent and then pay off existing student loans that the parent might have? I don't know why you would do that, but... Is that possible? That's a good question. Because um, you can transfer the beneficiary right. across family members, right. Right? right? But maybe there's a stipulation that you can't for yourself. I don't even know why I would do that. Right. But um, Off the top of my head, I think it says for the, the child or their siblings, but okay. not for the parent. But, okay. but you're right. There, are, there is a lot of flexibility there in changing the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. And I have seen parents change the beneficiary to themselves. If they're going back for a master's degree and want to use these funds for that, they can do that. So that's, I mean, it's really interesting. And I think one of the things when I was looking at 529s was, okay, I, this seems really narrow. What if my student, for example, gets a full scholarship, but the fact that you can use it for graduate school, that you can transfer to a grandchild, it sort of makes 
as long as there are educational expenses in the life of your family, you're very likely to be able to use uh, the money in that 529 plan. Um, now, you've mentioned some of the tax benefits associated with accruing gains within those investments. What about those tax incentives just for contributing to a 529 plan? Um, how does that differ from state to state? Right. So the tax incentives for contributing really vary state to state, and it depends on what state you live in. So I'll use New York, for example. In New York, you can contribute to the New York 529 plan, and contributions up to $10,000 can be used to reduce your taxable income that you're reporting to that state. Mm. So it does not affect your federal tax return, but it can reduce your state taxes in that state. A lot of states don't have state tax like Texas, for example. So they don't have that benefit. Gotcha. Um, but there are quite a few states who try to give you that incentive to contribute to the plan and get a, a write-off on your taxes to reduce that burden. Yeah. We have that in Oregon. In Oregon, it's a little funkier. You hit different thresholds based on your income level and you get tax credits based on the amount that you have uh, invested into a 529 in the Oregon plan. Um, and then I noticed this past year, Lori, I was sharing with the finance team, that I was telling my mom, you can contribute to a grandchild's 529 plan in Arizona and get some tax benefits from that. So I was trying to, you know, kind of elbow her in the ribs on that front. Um, right. All right. Now, what about choosing them? Like there's savingforcollege.com that has information about every state's 529 plan. How do I go about making the right choice? And I think that probably there's a, two different categories, right? Either I get some state tax breaks or I don't. What does the choice look like depending on which category I fall into? Right. So shopping around based on the state you live in and comparing it to other states is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the fund choices that you have. Um, some of the, these plans are owned by the state, but they're managed by individual investment firms. So right. Naming some names doesn't mean they're better or worse than anybody else, but for example, Fidelity. A lot of people will say, I want to invest in Fidelity, but I want I want my 529 plan to be managed by Fidelity. So then you look for that state that has a Fidelity plan. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of options there. And even within that, you have choices of funds to choose from, you know, going as risky or as conservative as you want to go with your investments. So I think um, first and foremost, looking at your own state's plan, um, if there is an investment advisor that you already have funds with and you want to stick with them, look for plans that are managed by that investment firm. Um, or looking at like Saving for College, they have a top 10 list where they've right. done the evaluations based on benefits and performance and things like that. But as you said in the beginning, you know, this is, it is an investment. You can lose money in these. So it's something you have to think pretty strongly about. Right. And, and, you know, you got to think about what your risk profile is going to be and how conservatively you want. They've got a lot of great target date funds that will automatically rebalance as your student gets closer to 18, which is their, obviously their college going age. Mm -hmm. That's also the point in time, Lori, that you start applying for financial aid. And I was hanging out with some other parents of nine-year-olds this weekend. And one of the parents asked me about financial aid qualifications and how the savings account can affect the qualification for financial aid. What is the relationship between a savings account like one of these 529s and the eligibility that you have for financial aid? That is a big question that we get all the time. The 529 plans, whether a savings plan or prepaid or the Coverdell account, are all treated as a parent's asset. So it's treated the same in the financial aid process as you have cash in the bank or in your savings account or stocks that you own. It's not mm -hmm. treated any worse or, or any better. Parent-owned assets are factored into the financial aid equation at about 5%. So if you have saved $100,000 in all your children's 529 plans combined, that's going to have a $5,000 impact on your financial aid eligibility. So not very is, much. Is that going to be per year that that $5,000 yes. will count? Okay. Yeah. So if my, um, ex if my expected financial contribution, my, my family contribution is $20,000 without accounting for the 529, then it would be $25,000 if I had invested at $100,000. Right. In, but you would have a hundred thousand dollars available to pay for college. So you'd be in which a feels like it's position. kind of worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's, it's a small, it's a small fee to pay. There is in mentioning, you know, sort of the, um, some of the drawbacks, right. There's 
both the effect that it has on your financial aid eligibility, which is quite small, but also penalties if you choose to withdraw some of these funds and not use them for educational expenses. There are circumstances where you can do that. What does that look like for someone that might need access to that money? Right. So you can withdraw at any time from these accounts and use the money. But if it's not for the specified expenses, um, you will have to pay federal income tax on the earnings portion. Mm -hmm. So whatever percentage of your withdrawal is earnings, you'll pay federal income tax on that and a 10% penalty on those earnings. Very similar to if you withdrew from your retirement early or, or something like that. Um, if you're withdrawing it because your child received a large scholarship and you no longer need the money, you get that 10% penalty waived. Oh, so you can still, like if you got a $20,000 scholarship, you could withdraw 20,000 from the 529 plan, still pay any taxes that are required on that, mm -hmm. but um, not the 10% penalty um, gotcha. because it was a scholarship. That's interesting. Very interesting. So that so that actually makes the argument that well, my kid might qualify for a scholarship a little more moot. Um, you know, you still a good idea to uh, invest in those five two nines. Now you mentioned retirement, and I think when people kind of take a step back and they're starting to look at the cost of college and where the money is going to come from, they're not just looking at these savings accounts for college. They're also looking at their four hundred one ks, other kinds of retirement accounts. Is that a route that that parents should consider? Is it a is are there any tax advantages to doing so, and any potential drawbacks too? So, um, as someone who's approaching retirement, you want to be careful about using your retirement early. Yes. Yeah. Um, the Roth IRA, the individual retirement account, uh, the Roth is the most flexible for mm -hmm. use for college because a Roth allows you to access the principal and leave the earnings in there. So you could access right. your principal amount of your Roth to pay for college, even if you're not retirement age. Okay. And so is there a particular reason that someone might choose to do that just because they're maybe they're short and they've got this principal because of investments they made over a mm -hmm. period of time? Um, is there a penalty, similar penalty if you're taking out the earnings from a Roth or is it greater? If you're not 59 and a half and you access the earnings, it's the same thing, a 10% penalty on those earnings. Gotcha. So you have to figure out what that that's worth to you in terms of right. covering that cost uh, of investment. Are there any other vehicles or um, just things that are connected, especially to these tax advantages? I think that they tend to be small and they're obviously very state specific here and there. Although the, the tax savings that you get on earnings, I think is pretty significant. And that's not something that you'll see in a traditional you know, investment account, uh, brokerage account. Um, anything else that we might want to draw people's attention to? Um, well, I think look at all your options. Really consider that anything you can save now, even if it doesn't have a tax incentive, is something you won't have to borrow when the time comes. Yeah. Most people are, you know, we're, we're dealing with that now with seniors in the spring um, who are floored by the cost that they have to pay and they really wish they had saved more. So, um, you know, they, these plans look pretty restrictive from the outside, but they are pretty flexible because of the change of the beneficiary and the long list of things you can use them for and the, uh, the waiver of the penalty for the scholarship. So, so I would say, you know, if you have children and you think college is in the future, you know, think about putting some money aside, maybe diversifying some Roth IRA, some regular savings and some 529 or some mix of those so that you have um, some options when it comes time to pay for college. That sounds good. Um, I don't know what I'm doing, but I got a lot of different things going at once. So maybe that's maybe that's the best way to do it. Um, Lori, thanks for coming on the show and walking through this stuff. It's it is more and more relevant for me every time. So I, I really appreciate the guidance. <laughs> No problem. Happy to be here. Awesome. All right. That does it for this week's show. Uh, really was a pleasure to talk to all three of our guests. I hope if you uh, are just tuning in for this segment with Lori, because she's your favorite, that you'll also go back and listen to our first segment with Jack Murphy about his college process. Um, and we talked a little bit about the wait list as well. Next week, we have a really terrific show lined up for you. We're going to have the deans of admission from Babson, Olin, and Wellesley, three colleges that tend to work together in a mini consortium there. Uh, and they're going to come on to talk to us all about admission and financial aid. So it'll be a really terrific show. You won't want to miss it. Until then, we hope you have a great week and weekend and take care.